Welcome to the first of several um, short video lectures that you are going to get. These are going to be in case study format. They're going to be short, hopefully about 10 minutes, we'll see. And basically telling you about a certain segment of history as a primer to accompany what you will read in the textbook and what we will discuss in class. Today we are going to discuss the Protestant Reformation. And we're not going to discuss the Protestant Reformation from the aspect of um, Martin Luther, as many do. We will get to him. But I think we need to start with the one man who really kicked it all off. The one man who, almost as a surprise, started this entire movement. And his name is Johann Tetzel. Now, Johann Tetzel was a small little friar, dumpy fellow by every uh, description who was going around at the uh, command of the Vatican, going around what we would now call Northern Germany, selling what he called tickets to heaven. Yeah. Now, these are indulgences, and you know from your reading what indulgences are, and we're going to talk more about that. Um, but when he got to the town of Wittenberg, Frederick the Wise, or Frederick the Saxon, the, the leader, the prince, if you will, of this area, would not let him enter. Now, before you think this is some holy kind of idea, Frederick the Wise wouldn't let him enter for a very specific reason. Because Frederick the Wise had the largest collection of relics in Northern Europe. Um, and he got a lot of business. He got, he got a lot of people coming to visit his kingdom to see these relics. So he told Tetzel that he could not hawk indulgences in his area. Well, here's the thing. Tetzel went to the next town over that was outside of Frederick the Wise's realm and sent people to put up flyers claiming, come to the next town and you can buy these tickets to heaven, right? It, it's not that the church was kind of pitching it this way. It's not that they were being that aggressive. It's that this Tetzel guy who was angry at Frederick the Wise did made this kind of statement that some thought went a little too far. And one of the guys who thought it went too far is this gentleman. Yes, his name is Martin Luther, or I like to call him Luther Puffy Cheeks. Um, this is not Martin Luther King. Okay. Um, well, he lost it. He lost it. And according to the tale, according to the tale that I was always told growing up and even in college, he wrote out the 95 thesis. He marched up to the Wittenberg Cathedral and he plastered them to the door and nailed them to the side of the door in this, this moment of defiance. And that's just not true. There's no real truth in it. The reality is that the cathedral at Wittenberg was the college cathedral of the University of Wittenberg. Martin Luther was a professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg. And what he did is he posted up on what you would think of as a bulletin board a list of discussion points for a lecture he was about to give. He gave the lecture, and you know what? N nothing happened. But this is where we get to that unsung hero of history. Right? Somebody, we don't know who, got a hold of this list or went to the talk or something. They translated it from Latin. By the way, it was written in Latin, so none of these people in these pictures you see could actually read it. Translated into Latin and then published it. Because Wittenberg had one of, say, ten printing presses in the world at that time. Here's the thing. It sold. And it sold well, so more were printed. All this unbeknownst. To Martin Luther. You can imagine his students coming to the class going, hey prof, love your theses. He'd been like, eh? But anyways, um, so, but immediately, this moment of October 31st, 1517, 1517, um, it did do something. It made Martin Luther and those around him, more importantly, realize the importance, the reach of this. So they started writing and publishing. They did prints of the Pope as kind of a crocodile and a snake. They wrote uh, very academic kind of 
discussions of the topic, but they also were very common discussions of the topic that, that the basic literate public, which is a small percentage, but an important percentage, could actually read. Well, needless to say, you might ask, doesn't he get in trouble for this? Is, isn't he not a heretic? Of course he's a heretic. But here's the thing. Um, and you can see Wittenberg oh, in the top of your map there under Brandenburg. Um, all of the princes around him in that pink color wrote to his side. They converted and they started following him. And of course the person most important is Frederick of Saxon. Now, Frederick of Saxon has a lot of pictures that make him look stately. I like the one that makes him look like a pirate. So, he took Martin Luther, hid Martin Luther in his winter palace, because he had a winter palace, um, when the authorities, the church authorities, and the um, uh, Roman emperor, excuse me, the holy Roman emperor, was after him, hid him away to protect him. Now, you, you say, why would he do this? Why would anybody do this? Let's go back to the map. Um, if you look, suddenly all of those people in pink start recognizing Luther's version of the church. And Luther's version of the church doesn't have a pope. So suddenly, they don't have to listen to what the pope says. More importantly, they don't have to pay taxes to the church. So suddenly, they can take that money and just put it in their pocket. Um, so he's going to get a following, but now it's, it's basically a guy complaining. Um, but in 1520, he comes up, oops, sorry, forget him. 1520, he comes up with the outline rules, the, the moments um, that will define the religion we now know as Lutheranism. They were in his pamphlets written in 1520, and they are three parts. Follow with me. Number one justification by faith alone. It means that good deeds don't matter. It doesn't matter what you do, it's do you believe in the whole Jesus God trinity thing, Christianity, right? Do you believe? If you do, you're going to heaven. That's it. Zero. No, nothing else. Um, two, primacy of the scripture. It says that all knowledge and authority is in the Bible. If all knowledge and authority is in the Bible, then it doesn't matter what the Pope says, it doesn't matter what priests say, any church doctrine, any church interpretation, doesn't matter, because it's all in a book. And so if you have that book, that's the authority, which means you don't have to listen to any of those church officials anymore. Finally, three, priesthood of all believers, which means who can be a priest? Anyone as long as they can read and read the Bible. Which means if you can read the Bible, you can understand everything in the scripture. You have no need for priests. You have no need for hierarchy. You have no need for the Pope. You have no need for the greater Catholic, Orthodox, or any type of Christian church. That's it. Well, that flies in the face of everything that the church has been doing since the Council of Sia in the 300s under Emperor Constantine. You can imagine how this is going to shake things up. And you can imagine that once he does it, people like Luther and people like Henry VIII are going to follow his lead. Be it for purposes of wealth, be it for purposes of true belief, be it for purposes of political power, doesn't matter. What we know is it happened.